Many critics of the European Union have said from day one that it's an undemocratic system. <clears throat> well, by Gingo, they're right, aren't they? Because the government of the European Union is the unelected European Commission. It is the civil servants who have the sole right to propose legislation. It is the civil servants who have the sole right to amend that legislation. All we can do, as the elected bit of it, is to effectively rubber stamp and occasionally amend and delay that legislation. It's incredible. It's quite incredible. After two massive world wars that caused such ruin, destruction and misery across Europe, two world wars that were fought to stop people robbing individuals of democracy, to give nation states the ability to run their own lives. It is incredible that with this European Union model, we've turned our backs on it. But that was then. But it's got even worse than that. Because in the early part of this, uh, this last decade, the EU decided, let's stop pretending. Let's now announce that we are actually a state. And let's have a European constitution. Do you remember? And, you know, there were big ceremonies and European Union flags and anthems and the launching of this constitution. They tried to pretend that it was being drafted in a way that the Founding Fathers drafted the Constitution of the United States of America. But they had a slight problem. And the problem was that in one or two countries, they had to put it to a referendum. And the French said no. And the Dutch overwhelmingly said no. And we all know, had this gone to a referendum in Britain, or in Germany, or frankly, almost every country, uh, the answer would have been no. But what they did, I think, sums up the EU as we know it today. They absolutely refused to accept the no votes, refused to accept their validity, they rebranded it as the Lisbon Treaty, and in fact, um, it, an Italian politician, D'Amato, former Prime Minister of Italy, actually openly said, the good thing about calling this a treaty and not a constitution is that we don't have to put it to referendums. Just to give you an idea of how democratic these people are. Well, of course, there was a problem. Because one country, Ireland, under their constitution, had to put it to a referendum. And the Irish said no. What a wonderful day that was in Strasbourg. We turned up the next day and we had green... Uh, T-shirts made with respect the Irish vote, and over 100 MEPs wore them. Uh, one of my colleagues even wore a little leprechaun hat. <laughs> and we were all in, all in very, very jolly spirits indeed. Um, and there was a debate on the Irish vote. And I'll never forget what Martin Schulz, who is the leader of the European Socialist Group and the European Socialist Party, said. Schulz said, in the wake of Ireland voting no, we must not bow to populism. By which he meant the democratic will of the people of Ireland. We must not bow to populism. And in response to that, I gave one of my speeches in the European Parliament. And for those of you that have seen YouTube, you will know I am consistently helpful and moderate in all things. <laughs> and I pointed out that actually what was happening here was that an undemocratic organisation was now becoming an anti-democratic organisation. Such was their total contempt for the views of the people of Ireland, of the Netherlands, of France, or anywhere else. They are the masters. They know what is best. They know what is good for us, and damn all of us if we think we're going to have any democratic say. I remember on that day just how angry they'd become. The Schultz again spoke in that debate, um, compared my behaviour in the Parliament to that of Adolf Hitler in the Reichstag. I mean, there is no form of abuse that these people won't sink to. Uh, Danny Cohn-Bendit, who was the leader of the Paris riots back in 1968, said that I was mentally ill. Well, my family might agree with that, but, but, but I mean, you know, this is how dangerous these people are. This is why I'm saying to you, the whole thing is anti-democratic. It's only 20 years ago that there was a regime a little to the east of here called the Soviet Union. 
who used to operate in exactly the same way. They didn't have commissioners, they had commissars. They had five-year plans, and ten-year plans, and twenty-year plans. They organised the thing on the basis of central planning and control. They organised the thing on the basis that they knew what was best for people, and that, and that people weren't competent to decide their own future. And, 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 I, and I think that any argument that we can reform, amend, or change the European Union to democratise it, to open it up, died in 2005 and 6 with their behaviour over those free, fair and democratic referendums. So I now find myself, former yuppie and city boy, in the rather strange position of being the joint leader of the only opposition group that the European Parliament has really ever had in its entire existence. And I may not be popular amongst the political class, but I couldn't care less. I don't want to be popular amongst those people, these career politicians who care more about themselves than they care about nation states and they care about democracy. But what I do know is that right across our continent there is a growing wave, a growing democratic revolution that is taking place and it's being led predominantly by your generation. Your generation who can see that if we're going to have successful futures we must be part of a global economy and not close our minds and believe that Europe is the beginning and the end of everything. A young generation who actually want to be able to determine their own futures through the ballot box. That's the point about democracy, isn't it? In democracy, you don't just vote for your government, but you have the ability, once every four or five years, to say you're a cheating, lying, dirty lot of rascals, get me gone, and I'll put somebody else in with a different manifesto. That's what the young people across Europe are saying, <clears throat> and I think we have a very interesting specimen of this in Finland, right at this moment in time. In Finland, which has been a three-party system, a conservative, socialist and liberal party system, and in Finland, the Eurosceptic party, the True Finns, um, whose, whose MEP, I'm proud to say, is part of our group, are up to 18.5% in the polls and are just one point behind the government with six weeks to go before the general election. So things are changing across Europe, and is it any wonder when you look at the way we're governed? You know, I, it, it was objectionable enough to have a European Commission in day one, but what did the Lisbon Treaty give us? It gave us Herman van Rompuy. <laughs> the President of Europe, and <clears throat> it seems that I rather upset him. I, I, I did make the point that we've been told that once we had a, Euro a President of Europe, it would be a figure so big and powerful that he would stop the traffic in Beijing and Washington. And I was struck that I didn't really think that Herman van Rompuy would stop the traffic in Brussels, let alone anywhere else. And so I did say, it's true, that he had the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. Now, I don't think, as far as political insults go, that was really too heavy. I mean, after all, I've told you what they've been calling me in the Parliament, and that's apparently fine. But, oh, goodness me, didn't it cause a bit of a storm? And I was asked for the President of the European Parliament. I went in for a meeting with him. And a piece of advice to all of you, when you leave university and you go on uh, and, and you pursue your careers wherever you go, whenever you're invited to a meeting, and the person inviting you doesn't offer you coffee, you're in big trouble, all right? <laughs> so I went in to meet the President of the European Parliament, and it was very much an interview without coffee. And he said to me, I'm asking you to apologise. I said, oh yes. He said, I want you to apologise to the European Parliament. I want you to apologise to Mr. Herman van Rompuy, and I want you to apologise to the people of Belgium. And I said, any advance? Was there anything else I must do? You know. So, I, of course, I completely refused. But I did, the next day, um, was after some thought, um, apologise to bank clerks the world over for any offence that I might have caused. Um, but so upset with me were they, that they fined me the maximum fine that the European Parliament can bring in. 
Um, and they fined me 10 days pay because I wasn't very nice about Mr. Van Rompuy. And the President of the Parliament said to me, this will never happen again. And I thought, well, how on earth are they going to stop me? <laughs> Um, and last week, I had a little, little exchange with him last week, and <clears throat> there he was in December, shaking hands with, of course, Colonel Gaddafi. <laughs> the man that is now our enemy, although on reflection, I suppose it was one unelected leader greeting another unelected leader, <laughs> so perhaps nothing terribly unusual about that. So when I do admit, I've been a bit of a thorn in their side, um, but apparently what's really upset them are my comments about Belgium. That's what's really upset them. And the British Foreign Office have said, or said to me at the time, um, that, that, that I'd, I'd done a terrible thing. That I'd insulted this great unified nation of Belgium. <laughs> well, I think that when we look back at our histories, uh, when we look back at our own lives, often there are things for which we should apologise. And as a British person, I think I should apologise to you all tonight for the artificial creation of Belgium. Back in 1839. <laughs> shouldn't have done it. I don't know what we were thinking of. Of course, effectively, we really had you as a buffer zone, didn't we? Didn't we? Between, between the French and the Germans. I mean, that was the, that was the thinking of the Brits at the time. Um, and, you know, as long ago as a hundred years ago, before the First World War, there were senior Belgian politicians saying this place is not a country, it's not a nation. So quite why me saying it has caused such great offence, I don't know. Uh, but I do note that I made these comments on the 24th of February last year, that Parliament was dissolved in Belgium at the end of April, and there hasn't been a government since, and it's over 280 days. So I do feel borne out by this. And I have to say, I, I, I have to express um, a slight prejudice of my own. Um, I do think that the Flemish people deserve to have their own independent free state. And if I can do anything to help them get it, I will. But please bear in mind, if, you, if and when you get your independent, self-governing, democratic, free state here, what will be the point of it if you're part of a European form of government that already makes over 75% of the laws of the nation states? What will be the point of it, particularly here, where you know, you, your, your success in business through hard work and entrepreneurial flair will be destroyed by the employment regulations, by the ladder regulations, by some of the crackpot uh, regulations on the environment? What would be the point of any of it? What would be the point of democracy if we're all swallowed up by this state? So my job, I feel, is to help lead initially and, 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 then, and then link arms right across this European continent with like-minded people. We're not from the right, we're not from the left, we're not from the centre. We come from all walks of life. We believe in democracy. We believe in self-government. We believe in having our own proud nations. I want a Europe that trades together. I want a Europe that works together. I want us to agree you know, sensible, common, minimum standards on things. I want to have reciprocal deals between British universities and German universities. I want to do all of those things that we ought to be doing in the 21st century as next door neighbours. But we cannot have those freedoms and we cannot have our democracy all the while the Van Rompuys and Barrosos are ruling our lives, and the sooner we get rid of them, the better. Thank you. Okay, well I'm sorry if, I, uh, if, if, if you feel I wasn't direct enough in that talk. Um, and if anybody doesn't understand what I'm saying, there we are. Uh, but you know, I believe in this very, very strongly indeed. You see, I, I have this feeling that if you take away democracy from people, rather like our friends in Greece at the moment, if the way you vote in the next Greek general election doesn't matter because you can't set interest rates, you can't set tax rates, because the European Central Bank and the unelected uh, uh, bureaucrats and officials in Brussels now run your country, if democracy is taken from you, all you are left with 
is civil disorder and civil disobedience. And my great fear is that unless we get proper democratic solutions to our future in Europe, that what we will see is a Europe of a whole mass of little mini nasty civil wars. And that's why I feel it is so important that somebody that's got four children that we fight to get freedom and democracy back.